and I've never forgotten one day he had a cigarette in his hands and he was saying to me, he would sort of uh, uh, pull and then uh, release the smoke in the air and say, son, never smoke. <laughs> <laughs> this is very bad for <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't adding up. Okay, on the one hand, you don't know to smoke, and this man is doing the very thing he's saying is not good for me. Now, the same thing can happen in the Christian faith. It's just that it's a lot more subtle. The subtleness can be, for instance, in the way we relate as husband and wife. If we do not show, for instance, when we do wrong, that we should apologize, then of course the children begin to learn that, okay, so it's only when you are young that you should apologize for doing wrong. When you grow old, you become a law unto yourself. They learn that from our actions. Or, if you are a person who kicks up tantrums, you really get upset, you call everybody names, you even storm out of your house, you bang the door behind you, and so on. Of course, the impression that you are creating in their minds is okay. So when you are old, you are allowed to now just turn yourself into a volcano, it's okay. And so, they do not see that even an adult needs to tame their temper, to tame, because they are under God's authority. That they also need to be sanctified in all their ways. So, as a father, remember, especially for teenagers upwards, because I hope to deal with this a little more tomorrow, you can't cheat them. They are extremely observant. They see more than you think they see. So whatever you are teaching them, you yourself must be the primary example. Remember, especially the father figure. Because when they get out there, they have to learn that laws don't change simply because you are the boss. We are all under God. We must submit to him. Having said that, then, let me quickly move on to the next part of this verse. Because notice that it begins on a, on a negative note. Having said fathers, the next thing it says is, do not provoke your children to anger. Or, putting it a little differently, do not frustrate your children. Do not exasperate them. Now, what he speaks about is the fact that parenting is like walking a tightrope. It's, it's a balancing act. If you go too much one way or too much another way, what you end up producing are exasperated children, products. Let me give an obvious example. If you are never listening to them, you are always just punishing. You are nothing but a disciplinarian. Clearly, they become rebellious. You, you fill them with rage. They, they, they want to fight you. There's bitterness that grows up in them they become exasperated. Because they want somebody to listen to them. They, they want you to, 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 to sit 
and hear them out as they really are. Well, the opposite is it were equally true. If you are sort of over sympathetic, whatever they say, yes. Ice cream, yes. <laughs> Can we borrow your car here, the kids? Anything they want. Want to spend the night out? It's okay. You can go and sleep out. Never in any way providing any control. <laughs> no, don't worry. I raise my own no, no. Yeah. So, when they finally get into the real world and meet the nose, they will fail to process that. And consequently, they will again become bitter. Because that's not the way they grew up. They got anything and everything they wanted when they were growing up. Now that they're grown up, they're meeting people who are saying, no, I want to go and leave. It's my friend's birthday. No. What do you mean, no? There's no have meanings. It's <laughs> <laughs> no. <coughs> they storm out of the boss's office, still go for the friend's birthday party. Come back, they are surprised that they are fired. <laughs> Surprise. They become bitter with the world because, again, you were on the wrong extreme. So parenting is a balancing act. And that's something that is difficult to maintain because we all are imbalanced, all of us. I, I know we want to believe we are balanced, but we are not. We tend to be on one side or the other. Recognizing that is a great help. Now, what I want to do very quickly now is to just mention almost in at galloping speed a number of ways in which this comes out. And then tomorrow I want to deal with that in a little more detail. I have before me here um, seven ways in which we can exasperate or frustrate or provoke our children to anger. The very first one which will make up a lot more of our talk, is uh, a failure to recognize their stages of growth. A failure to recognize the stages of growth. Now, I'm sure you've heard a child say, why are you still treating me like a child? Yeah. And they often say it in anger, in frustration. Because you are still treating them like a toddler when they are now teenagers, or you are treating them like teenagers when they are now young adults. You are not learning to give them the room, the space, according to their levels of growth. And that will come in extremely handy as we shall be dealing with the different stages of growth and the kind of demands they invariably place on us. The second way in which we exasperate our children is when we do not give them a sense of home in the home. The world out there is very demanding on all of us, not just our children, but even us. We, we want to have a place where you can be yourself. You can take off your shoes, ladies, let down your hair. You know, it's your space. Our children need that as well. One of the signs, for instance, that you, you will discover that your children have entered into teenagers and young adult stage is when you come into their bedroom and previously just used to bang, go in. And now they say, Dad, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh -oh. <laughs> they, they, 
they are saying we have some space here which is ours. Or sometimes you find an actual notice on that door. <laughs> this is the girl's bedroom. Knock before you enter. Wait for an answer. <laughs> If they are always on their tentacles, you will in due season see that they will not grow up normal. Properly. Again, you will see the meanings of this as the children get old. <coughs> the third is when only corrective discipline is used and no formative discipline. Only corrective discipline, not formative. What I mean by that is you don't take the time to positively train them about anything. But you are always there to punish or rebuke or shout at them, whatever, when they do something. Now, that can be extremely hurtful. Because they are recognizing the fact that you, you don't actually spend time teaching. I remember one time a lady came into my office. She's not a member of my church, but you know, back home in Zambia, as a pastor in the community. <laughs> she came in and she said, Look, you, you need to help me. My, my husband is a total mess. All our sons are a total mess. My, our daughters are just excellent, excellent, you know. Uh, there must be some wrong spirit which they are carrying, maybe from their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So when I, 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 I took her to a passage in the Bible, which we'll look at tomorrow, and um, it's where um, Solomon is instructing his children, and he's saying, when I was a child, uh, in the only child in my mother and so on. Mm -hmm. My father taught me this and things like that. So I said, have you noticed here there's three generations of teaching? The, the, the father taught Solomon, and that's probably David. And then Solomon is teaching his sons. I said to her, does your husband ever go into the boys bedroom and just relax with them and start talking to them about life, the issues of life. She pissed <laughs> up! Is it bad? Never! When he goes into that bedroom, just know it's trouble! <laughs> And she spoke in Bemba and said, Name nephew Vare Shiva. I said, There you have it. Clearly, there's something wrong there. And I'm not surprised if your sons are Then I turned to her and I said, Now, in your case, you probably spent quite a bit of time cooking with your daughters. I said, Yeah, I said, doing household chores. And I said, what occupies your time then? She, in terms of talking, she says, ah, oh, we discuss it, Lord. I said, there you are. So, in the process of spending time with your daughters, you are inadvertently passing on information, training them, and so on. Your husband doesn't do a thing like that. Invariably, you are providing formative training to your daughters. There's no formative training for the guys. There is the difference. And you know, she, she paused for a moment and said, this sounds so obvious. I wonder why I missed it. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry we're late. <laughs> 
I won't say anything. I'm just teaching about being an example. <laughs> area is when your words contradict your actions. I think I've already in a sense handled that. The fifth is when you are not providing for their needs. Their basic needs. Education, clothing, food, shelter, etc. There's a sense in which it is inbuilt in children that parenting is about looking after us. It doesn't matter what you're going to say to them. It's in belt. It's That's the way God wires us up when we are born into this world and we have parents. Parents and provision are synonymous in the mind of a child. So if a child has a need and psychologically they know that even if I go to this man, I know, it's obviously no. You don't know what to do. Yes, when it's a reasonable no, remember, that's part of their training. But when it's just a no, because it, it's a no. Like one girl said, um, her mother gave birth to her as a teenager and handed her over to the grandmother. And then she now wanted to go to university. And the mother said, her real mother said, I don't have money. This girl said, I knew she just didn't want to provide for me. What made it worse was that Within a week, the mother then went on holiday to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Woo! The email this young lady sent to me, when you touch the screen of the computer, <laughs> <laughs> she was fuming. <coughs> now, clearly, it's because she felt, I'm entitled. This woman prefers to go on holiday than to help me with my education. So especially when it's by negligence, it will be tested. Again, the older they grow, the more they are able to understand these things. The sixth is when you cut across their sense of justice and fairness, please remember, the sense of justice and fairness is God-given. A little toddler will one day say to a toddler, teach you about fairness. <laughs> it's inbuilt in us, this issue. So when a parent is full of favoritism, when a parent doesn't punish one child for an error and then punishes another child for the same era, just know that second child has taken note of it in the brain. And before long, you lose that child because of this sense of desperation and bitterness. One more. And as I said, I'm just touching on them for now because. By the time we become to deal with teenagers and young adults, these things will come together and show us why often we fail in the final product when in fact we could have done much better. 
The last is when you are too busy with other things, to be with them, and this is important, to listen to them. You know, children see parents as the ears that they can speak. Now,